So uh, again, thank you, and um, thanks for the invite to talk to uh, everybody or present some work we've done um, over the last few years uh, at the seminar series today. Um, I'm going to be presenting on behalf of a wonderful team that I work with um, across Canada. So I'm happy to be here. And uh, the topic, uh, the title is uh, Mission Impossible, the Implementation Experience. So I'm going to give you a multi-movie experience related to this mission that we set out to do. So before I begin, I want to let uh, everybody know I'm very uh, fortunate as an immigrant to live and reside and work here in Calgary, which is also the, um, the traditional territories of the Peoples of Treaty 7. And also the city of Calgary is home of the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. So I have no conflict of interest to declare in relation to this presentation, but the work I'm going to present today relates to um, kidney disease, and I must disclose my interests. I wear two hats here, um, indicated by the picture here of uh, when my interest in kidney disease, and it uh, stems from one, as a researcher, I'm interested in patient-oriented research and person-centered care, but also I am a caregiver to a family member that has near-end-stage uh, kidney disease. And I must disclose, as Megan knows, that I'm a dog lover and I have two rescued dachshunds. So to start with, I'm going to give you a preview of our work to date to give um, the opportunity to get you caught up on all the phases of the work we've done um, to support self-management for people with chronic kidney disease in Canada and abroad. So let's start with the cast. I am very fortunate uh, that this work I'm presenting today is driven by patients and caregivers um, that are located across Canada. Here's a, um, on this slide, you'll see the cast that includes some patients and caregivers from different provinces across Canada. Some of these patients and caregivers are still working with us and some have left us. The work we've been doing has been spanned around six, um, six seven years now. Also in the cast is researchers and clinicians. And if you look to your uh, lower right corner, you'll see Dr. Sharon Strauss, who has been an uh, integral um, member of the team over the years for this um, work around kidney disease and self-management. So I wanna give you a recap before we get to Mission Impossible part five. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, far, um, previous versions or work that was done um, in this area. So. We first did a Mission Impossible Part 1, where we were establishing the shot. So we knew that patients identified as a priority um, across Canada, the lack of support for self-management for chronic kidney disease. So people that are not on dialysis or not on trans or not have it, had a transplant. And we started this work with establishing the shot of doing a scoping review. And we found that there's limited evidence or, or limited information and resources around self-management for these patients um, with early stage chronic kidney disease. From there, we also did that, it's not indicated on the slide, but we also did an environmental scan to understand what are the resources that are currently on the ground in Canada to support self-management for people with chronic kidney disease. That led to our Mission Impossible Part 2, The Conflict where we needed to understand why is there this mismatch between what we're seeing in the literature, what we find that is limited in the literature, and what we find that has been um, on the ground in clinics in Canada around um, supporting self-management. And so we did a qualitative study where we interviewed uh, patients and caregivers across Canada to understand what are they seeing and give us more details around their experiences around self-management for their kidney disease. And what they said that they wanted something that they could have a tangible tool that can be accessed when they wanted it for what they wanted it, and when they were ready to access information and resources. So that led to our Mission Impossible Part 3, the resolution, where we co-designed with patients and caregivers from across Canada, a tool which is now um, up and running, called, which is a website, My Kidneys, My Health. Once that tool was up and running, we did a, a feasibility test to understand who's using it, how they're using it. Um, and under Mission Impossible Part 4, the critics' feedback was 
this is a great tool and it should continue to be developed. So just to review, who's our audience? Our audience is kidney patient, uh, people or individuals with kidney disease in Canada. And just to make a note that one in 10 Canadians have kidney disease. And this is the My Kidneys, My Health tool that's uh, um, been shown on your right hand side of the screen, which is open access. So there's no login, no cost for patients or the caregivers to um, access it. And it was created by patients for patients. And who, benefic who are the beneficiaries or who are the um, end users of this tool? Well, mainly patients and caregivers, but also healthcare providers, be it um, primary care physicians that share it, nurses in the community, um, nephrologists, other allied health working in multidisciplinary clinics. One key thing I should mention is that this tool reflects that we're trying to support self-management in chronic kidney disease because evidence shows that by um, supporting self-management, we can slow the progression of the disease and therefore patients um, do not end up on either dialysis or having a kidney transplant. And as, as I mentioned in our first phases of the work, that there were a few tools to support individuals in this early stage. Um, there's great tools out there that, uh, um, and they're Canadian based, like from the Kinney Foundation of Canada. They're excellent tools, but a lot of them focus, uh, their resources focus on what we consider end stage. So people on dialysis or ha having had a transplant. So again, My Kin is My Health was co-designed by patients for patients, and we're focusing on trying to make positive changes to address their illness needs, tailor resources when they wanted them and need them. So that brings us to the movie you're here to learn about today, the mission of our recent phase of work. So the plot of Mission Impossible Part 5 is this implementation experience. And the aim was um, around was implementing my kidneys, my health, but to understand how we can be we could be proactive um, around implementing it with clinicians in two different clinical settings, primary care setting and specialty care setting, which is the nephrology clinics. And the work that we uh, designed for the implementation experience was guided by two different process frameworks, the quality implementation framework and CanSol's pathway to implementation. So I'm going to touch a bit about both of those frameworks that guided this work. First of all, um, for this elaborate plan to be proactive in implementing this um, patient-facing or patient-mediated tool into clinical practice, I mentioned that we used the quality implementation framework and modified it a bit when we were, uh, were applying it, but looking at the phases of phase one about uh, considerations in terms of the setting and context that we're um, addressing with um, implementing this patient facing <clears throat> tool into um, clinical practice. The second phase was creating the structure for implementation and implementation plan, and then understanding improving and these iterative process of applications of um, the implementation into different clinical settings and then the sustainability of this. So that is a kind of highlight of the quality um, implementation framework. We were also, I say, stated that we were also using the CanSolve pathway to implementation. So ca the CanSolve CKD network supports the work that we've been doing over the last few years around self-management. And the Council of CKD Network has multiple projects, including the self-management project that it supports. And one of the key things that it has been looking at is it's great that we produce the evidence, but then how do we look at implementing it and putting it into practice? And so um, the projects under the Council of CKD Network are all trying and using and applying this tool in terms of um, planning implementation. As you can see, there's six steps on this pathway. Um, again, it looks like it's a, a linear pathway, but as we know, I've, you've been um, working in implementation and practicing um, a practitioner of implementation that it's not linear and it's more iterative. So I'm gonna go through a bit about this pathway and what we did. So the first part of this council pathway is creating awareness and interest. So we have been pretty fortunate that we've built relationships over the last five, six years, but based on our previous missions that I um, mentioned. So we have these long-term relationships with partners, with our patients and caregivers, both as patient partners, 
um, coming and going on our team, as I showed you a previous slide of our patient partners, but also um, patients and caregivers in terms of our participants and the work that we do in using our different methodologies. We've also built uh, um, strong partnerships with providers, both uh, nationally and locally here in Alberta. And those providers include primary care, so primary care physicians, um, nephrologists, um, nurses, and other allied health, such as pharmacists and uh, social workers in the community. And then finally, we've had this longstanding and continue to build relationships with um, professional organizations. As I mentioned already, the Kinney Foundation of Canada, both nationally and locally. Um, for example, the BC Renal Unit, um, our professional organizations around nursing professional organizations, um, around nurses that and uh, technicians that work in the in the kidney space, and also locally with our um, strategic clinical networks here in Alberta that support the connection between researchers, clinicians, and uh, frontline staff. The next uh, phase of look that uh, with this planning was um, understanding the readiness. So doing a readiness assessment, both in the settings of primary care and the specialty care clinics here in Alberta. So this is where uh, we took um, this process framework and started layering on other tools and models and frameworks to um, to help us identify and do this, this planning um, proactively for implementation. So here are some of the tools, and I'll go talk a little bit more about each of these um, and how we apply them, but it's the readiness thinking tool, the long-term success, success tool, and that many of you know the TDF, the theoretical domains framework, and then the C for the consolidated framework for implementation research, which many are probably aware of and have applied. The third thing on this pathway uh, to implementation was establishing the team. So that another framework we used to uh, and try this out with was using the implementation systems framework of the ISF, where we wanted to understand who's in the delivery system, who's in the support system, and who's in the synthesis translation system. So if we start at the bottom and look at the synthesis and translated system, that was our research team. So those slides I showed you with patient partners, researchers, um, clinicians, those and some and support staff, that's what sits in the synthesis and translation system. And those are the people that have been involved in all those phases in Mission Impossible part one through four. In terms of the support system, we consider this our implementation team. And so when we're looking at that, um, myself is part, is part of that team. We have an implementation coach, which is a, a research associate that's on the call, Sabrina, today. Um, clinicians in the clinical environment. So for example, in our uh, general nephrology clinics, having a nurse on the ground um, in the clinic, and also at a national level, having a knowledge broker um, from Council of um, CKD Network. And so this group helps to inform and prepare and support the individual healthcare professionals of the sites, but also understand the context of the sites. And as I mentioned, the delivery system, I mentioned that we have two settings that we're working with um, when we were um, proactively planning for implementation here in Alberta for the My Kidneys, My Health um, website. And that's the primary care clinics, which all work either the sizes of them are different, the way they're structured, some have no allied health support within them, some do, they have multidisciplinary team members, and also the general nephrology clinics, which uh, consist of a nephrologist, so a kidney doctor, seeing patients um, maybe once, they might see a patient once a year, maybe every um, two years. These are the patients they see that are not near end stage. And so those general nephrology clinics don't have necessarily some of the supports of a multidisciplinary team. So that is the third step in the implementation pathway. The fourth step was basically the project launch. And the things that we thought we'd try or look, investigate um, in terms of planning was looking at uh, the area compilation of strategies um, to look at matching to, which I'll talk about a little barriers and facilities we identified, then also Proctor's um, 
ACT framework, so the action, actor, context, target, and time framework. And then finally, to understand some of these strategies we um, have come up with proactively um, using the PEACE tool to see if they're feasible. So not all strategies that um, what came out of this could be um, applied or um, put into place for implementation. And then on the first step, implementation monitoring and evaluation, we that, um, looked at using EPSIS, so the evidence-based system for implementation support. So the key things in EPSIS are looking at implement, um, implement with uh, uh, approaching implementation with quality. So looking at supports that could include tools, training, technical assistance, and quality assurance when we identified the strategies that we needed to use. And finally, around the evaluation in terms of um, understanding, did we make a change using this proactive approach and then the metrics we looked at using the re-aim? So basically, um, oops. So basically from here, I'm gonna now walk you through more of the details of how we put this into practice. So I've identified a lot of um a lot of different frameworks and tools, but I want to tell you a little bit about how our team put these into practice. Okay, so the next thing was um, just uh, before I move on is I showed you how we mapped all of those uh, ideas and uh, guiding principles and frameworks to our council of um, implementation plan. But I also wanted to reflect back in the quality impl implementation framework and see how these tools kind of fit under um, those four different um, phases for the quality Im um, implementation framework. So you can see here the site assessments, implementation, evaluation, and then the shared lessons learned. So let's get into the action. So how did we really do this? It sounded good. Uh, we wrote a protocol, published it, but putting it into action. So executing this elaborate plan. Well, let's start with the site assessments. So what we did was we went out and did interviews and fo one focus group um, with primary care physicians and healthcare providers um, here in Alberta to understand what some of the issues were or some of the concepts around their readiness to implement a patient facing tool. A lot of clinicians um, have experience with implementing um, clinical tools. So we have different clinical tools that we use for assessment within our um, e-health tool systems or EMRs, but implementing and integrating a patient facing tool is a little bit new. So that's where we started. We want to understand what is the readiness and long-term success of implementing this and what are those barriers and facilitators. So as I previously mentioned, we used um, the different, uh, the readiness assessment, readiness thinking tool, the RTT, and uh, um, the long-term success tool to develop our interview guide. And then we interviewed these clinicians and some administrators we analyzed that data um, and did a deductive coding tree where we used the C some CIFR constructs and the TDF and developed these barriers and facilitators. Then we mapped those barriers and facilitators to those larger nine intervention functions and initially started with the error compilation, but then ended up using the BCT um, online tool to link to strategies um, to help us come up and design on the ground strategies to have successful implementation in these two different clinical settings, primary care and specialty clinics. And so when we hit that design phase of what we were gonna um, put on the ground, we use that APIS tool for feasibility, looking at cost of some of the ideas and strategies. We also looked at how we could tailor content um, for some of the written materials. We also went back to our patient partner panel, even though this is clinician facing, we went back to the patient partner panel because it's a patient mediated tool to start discussions in the clinical setting. So to understand and get their feedback around what they saw or what the data we found from the clinical and administrative perspectives, and then building this plan to implement. 
So some of the things that um, when we hit implementation was some of these tools that we identified from um, breaking it down into EPSIS is that like classic um, clinical stuff, they like printed, wanted printed materials, but they wanted a how-to guide, a very simple how-to guide for providers so that they could just look at and go, okay, here's some tips of how and why I should be implementing this into my clinical care um, and my clinical care session. Um, there was other things that they wanted more so around that, uh, um, the innovation or the website itself, um, more printed materials that were not just electronic, but could be printed off the website for the patients. In terms of technical assistance, we had coaching where there were reminders and emails and phone calls to the clinicians that were involved to see if for check-in calls and see how they were doing and if they needed other supports or had other ideas about um, some strategies that now that they were putting it into the clinical practice, so on the ground kind of um, addressing and adapting um, through this implementation period. We also had the classic training sessions, so education sessions um, with clinicians, be it primary care physicians, nephrologists, and allied health. And also along with demonstrations, like highlighting different things about the website that they could use for their patients and question and answer um, opportunities. And finally, in terms of quality assurance, I'll talk a little bit about this in a few slides, but monitoring on Google Analytics, understanding what is being used, what are some of the strategies that are working, what has been suggested, but maybe isn't working how we thought it would work. So with fidelity. So then we, so we did this proactive um, work to understand and barriers and facilitators and strategies implemented those strategies. And then we followed up with, again, a qualitative study to understand, okay, what have we, have we made a difference? Um, what has changed? Uh, what things um, have we tracked that needed to be changed along the way in terms of the implementation? And so what we did was, again, a qualitative study and we did interviews and another focus group. And just to note, some of these interviews uh, were um, with people that were in the pre um, session for interviews and some were not and same with the focus group and um, what we did was use the re-aim um, we did not look at effectiveness in terms of one of the re-aim um, constructs we also looked at data collection around document review so the documents that we created to um, support clinicians um, and uh, patient education and also google analytics and then what we did was again uh, deductive coding to the uh, re-aim the document reviews around the documents that were shared, emails, et cetera. And then the Google Analytics, which I'll share with you shortly. And then finally, we're gonna look at the next steps. So what do we gotta do that we have to change or adapt to based on what we found through this evaluation? So the fallout, so where are we at? Well, the biggest barriers that we heard both in some pre, but mostly after in the qualitative work we did after was around awareness, memory, time, motivation, and accessibility. And those first few um, ones, um, the awareness, memory, time, and motivation, a lot of those are things that we could um, change either through the implementation, prior to implementation, through implementation, um, and currently continue to work with, which shows some short-term. Um, things that we can address in the short term, and then accessibility is something that we're looking at in the long term. But when we look at these barriers, um, in terms of awareness, things that worked with this group, both in, and we see across primary care and um, primary care setting and within the specialty setting, was these classic presentations to clinicians, so more on the dissemination side, but also these postcards that they could give out to patients um, at their clinical visits, and then the classic posters. So these, these posters, so these kind of passive um, strategies. But one thing is what when we saw that we have over a thousand items that have been shared um, through the clinical, uh, the different clinical settings um, that have shown to improve provider and patient awareness of the website features. In terms of memory, classic people, um, clinicians would say, well, we don't have that many patients that come through with kidney disease, say weekly, monthly. So it's great to have some reminders. 
and those reminders built into um, their clinical routine. So visual reminders, they said were helpful and embed embedded into clinical practices. So we were very fortunate. We were able to build the links for My Kidneys, My Health into some other clinical online tools that we have, such as the CKD clinical pathway that would highlight if your patient has kidney disease, please um, refer them to this website. Other things was time. So we hear this all the time all the time, that time is an issue in clinical practice. But what, when we delved down into it and um, got to the roots, it was interesting that uh, clinicians identified that, oh, we can use some other champions in our clinic to, uh, to, uh, to help um, integrate this into our clinical care practice. But clinicians identified other clinician roles outside of their own. So for example, a physician would say, you know, I don't have the time, I have five minutes. But, oh, I can see the pharmacist doing this, or I can see um, the nurse in the clinic doing this, or I can see the medical office assistant providing them, the patient with a postcard, at least to introduce them to the website. So being able to identify roles within the scopes of practices of different professionals that they could do to um, encourage or take some of the offload, some of this work to other people that were interested in um, providing and playing a role in um, supporting self-management with um, patients with kidney disease. And the other thing was tailoring a, an appointment. So clinicians were able to express and then share with their peers around tailoring it. Oh, you know, it's the first time this patient's been in. I just show them the website and give them the information. But when they come in for a second visit, I dive into the needs because the patient comes back and shows me or asks me questions that I can refer them to the website and talk through it some of those topics. In terms of motivation, um, two things that uh, motivated clinicians were one around education sessions, getting in there, um, showing them, demonstrating um, the website, but also success stories that they heard that from their patients, that they, we heard success stories that patients would come back and say, that was really helpful. That, that empowered me, that gave me, I'm using the food tool or I have some questions that I've printed off from the website. So that, motivated uh, clinicians say that I'm going to continue to use it with my patients. And then this uh, long term about accessibility, about accessibility around language in terms of, um, you know, it's a website. So therefore, if you don't have the Internet, how are there other materials that we can support for um, patients that clinicians can provide for people that don't have um, it have accessibility issues, which it might be around technology, language, culture. So going to those Google Analytics, so our movie ratings. So by looking at our Google Analytics, we know that uh, in the last, from May 22 to 2023, we had uh, 4,000 users with an increase of 25%. So showing that uh, there's a trend, a, a trend in the positive direction with the work we've been doing about, there's an increase in page views um, from the year before. And then we can track um, people's behaviors in terms of how they get to the website, and, and what they're looking at and how long they're on it and, and, and dive a little bit deeper into also what are clinicians providing in terms of printouts and stuff to patients. So the top topics we know are food and diet, what is um, chronic kidney disease and medications. We can also look at where people are, how people are accessing the website and then um, our traffic sources. So as I mentioned, we embedded the website a link into the CKD pathway website. So you can see there that through referral, patients are getting that getting to the, the website, My Kidneys, My Health, and the Kidney Wellness Hub, which is supported by the Kidney Foundation of Canada um, and strongly supported in um, NBC. So again, linking to other um, other resources that patient that clinicians feel comfortable with that then they can um, refer their patients to. And um, these postcards have been a great thing. And now we've been asked to even um, make them smaller so they could be pocket size versus a postcard size. So again, having the ability through Google Analytics to, tra to um, track traffic. And the other thing is we have QR codes that are custom made to the different um, traffic sources. So we can then know where and um, our traffic is coming from using um, specific tailored QR codes. So in terms of lessons learned, um, some of the takeaways is this idea about, you know, we see dissemination and implementation um, on this kind of continuum, but they go together 
for the work we've been doing. If we don't disseminate and build awareness, then the next steps of in terms of um, the adoption and the use with fidelity of the website and stuff like that cannot take place. So this idea of continuous dissemination um, continues to go on. And uh, we do have a working group that is uh, made up of patient partners across Canada and uh, um, researchers and clinicians that are part of a working group that help us inform different dissemination strategies. And we meet a few times a year to, um, to brainstorm these ideas around um, strategies for tailored um, audiences or to tailor our dissemination strategies for, tailored, for audiences. In terms of our tailored strategies for implementation, um, we saw some things that carried over between um, primary care and specialty care, and then obviously some things that differed based on the context and settings and um, how they deal with the populations, um, both in primary and, and specialty okay. care. And the idea around this, um, that providers got motivated by the impacts they saw based on how their patients um, were becoming more um, self, have more self-efficacy and engagement in their care based on using the website. Limitations, I have their recruitment and recruitment. Well, we did this work during uh, COVID and continue to do this work. So um, as you'll um, reflect back, our sample size for our qualitative work in both stages pre and post was small um, recruitment in terms of our local context uh, here in Alberta and specifically around our primary care context really tough, um, but interesting enough that uh, some of the strategies that uh, the, that um, were identified and implemented are helping clinicians in primary care to then uh, manage um, caseload and provide effective care for patients with kidney disease. And then in terms of timing, ability to measure effectiveness. So we did not measure any key outcome around the effectiveness, say around, does this truly improve um, self-efficacy for patients with kidney disease. Stay tuned that this is the work that we're gonna continue to do. So coming up next, so what's the next, uh, what's the next sequel gonna look like? We're looking at sustainability. We were very fortunate uh, to get um, uh, SPORA funding through CHR to continue on with this work for four years. We're in our second year. And we have some updated cast on the left there, some of um, new members to our team. But our new mission is around adaptation of both um, the website itself, so the innovation, but also thinking about adaptations and understanding more around the implementation and strategies to be successfully implementing and, and scaling up um, across Canada. So for adaptations around the website to meet the needs of the diverse populations, um, to address um, Indigenous needs uh, in terms of sexual health. There's no, not a lot of information and direction to self support um, patients that have early stage chronic kidney disease around their reproductive and sexual health and peer support. So the end game is around uh, sustainability planning. And I'm going to wrap it up before I go on to the last few slides. There's uh, Anybody, can you tell me who is uh, Tom Cruise's stunt double in this picture? Does anybody want to come off the mic or um, share with me who do you think the stunt double is in the spoof? Ben Stiller. You got it. You got it, Selena. It is. So I just wanted to end here. So, you know, why do you have a stunt double? Um, they take risks. They put themselves in on the line to make uh, movies thrilling for us. But I can relate this to the work we're doing in terms of um, the credits for who we have had involved and continue to have involved. For the work I presented today, these are our stunt doubles. So our patients, our healthcare providers are willing to speak up and take risks and identify research priorities for people with uh, for kidney disease. Our team members, some of them are on the call today, are willing to take chances and try different approaches and methods. So this craziness of um, this mission impossible, taking all these uh, frameworks and models and theories and layering them on each other to address these research questions around 
um, implementation. And then finally, these organizations, the Can Council of the CKD Network, the University of Calgary, SPOR, CHR, and the Kidney Foundation of Canada, that are not only uh, financial partners and support, but partners in the knowledge mobilization that links us together with dissemination and implementation as we um, look towards the future to spread and scale. So thank you, and I'm happy to take um, to take uh, questions and comments. Thanks, Mo. Um, great presentation. Um, while our audience is thinking here about their questions, um, I would like to know, you know, um, in the TT Canada Summer Institute that we do every year, plug, shameless plug for that, um, you know, one of the things that we always end up discussing a lot is about how to choose between the the frameworks, the theories, models, and frameworks. So can you tell us a bit more about how you chose um, the tools and frameworks for this work? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Megan, for that question. Uh, okay, right off the top, because it's an interest area for me, I have to say that uh, that kind of drove uh, the, the, the theories, models, and frameworks in terms of let's see how we can uh, apply these. And I guess on that too is my you know, my title says I'm an implementation scientist. I don't see myself as an implementation scientist. I see myself as an implementation practitioner. And so I'm driven by taking the science, hence why working in KT and implementation and translating it into evidence. So what, taking the science of what we have in implementation with these theories, models, and frameworks, but let's see how they really work and how they don't work or how it can be overwhelming. So that's first of all, the interest in it. The second thing is around that um, we know that, um, as I mentioned, evidence does change. So we know with the CIFR, when it first came out, now we have CIFR 2.0, these things change, right? And so it's great, you can start with a plan and a, and a protocol, but then to apply them, these all these things, it, when you hit the ground running, it is tough. So I have this very, clear vision on paper of how to layer these things. But at, at the end of the day, um, it didn't pan out that way, which is fine. But in terms of getting back to the question, Megan, around how did I choose the specific ones? I always kind of categorize, okay, I always like a roadmap, so a process framework. So what are the steps? And I find that very useful for working with different teams and partners to say, okay, here's our process, what we're gonna do. We're gonna do this, 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 what do you guys think? Now within these steps, so that's why I use the quality um, implementation framework and then the can solve um, pa implementation pathway because people could see these clear steps, even though they look like steps, they are iterative, but that's clear. So that's how I choose um, uh, process frameworks, like the knowledge to action framework too, that's used a lot. Um, and I've used it a lot is that's how I chose that. I need a process to help communicate what we're gonna do. In terms of those other ones, it was kind of like, oh, okay, what's out there around identifying, you know, issues around readiness, or we should look at sustainability as we kind of want to question readiness. So kind of that's how I went about it and worked with the team to do that. But um, at the end of the day, I don't think there's any right way or wrong way. And I think the where we're moving to, a lot of these um, frameworks have been used uh, retrospectively to evaluate. And I'm interested in, can we apply them um, prospectively? Why aren't we planning actively for implementation rather than implementing and then looking at what our failures are? Not to say that there isn't failures after you do plan this, but that's how we go about our interest and then applying. I want to see how they work. Thank you. Um, so Sarah has her hand up and then uh, Rosman has a question in the chat after that. Okay, thank you so much. That was a, a great presentation and you made it really fun. I love the, the movie analogy that you thread through. Um, so I have, a, and I don't, you probably don't have a, um, an answer yet for this, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on um, scalability because these type, this type of work takes a lot of time and, and resources and I'm, I'm asking kind of selfishly because uh, our team is doing a very similar project, but we're a little bit further behind you um, on some resources around exercise for people living with bone metastases. Okay. And so we're just kind of at the end of our kind of co-designing our kind of knowledge product phase and starting to plan our 
sort of dissemination and implementation plan and kind of weighing that tension between doing a really thorough job of implementation, but also thinking to the future around what is actually feasible and, and scalable outside of the context of grant funding. Um, and so I'm curious if you have any thoughts having kind of got to the end and thinking about your next step um, around that tension with scalability. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Okay, first on your comment about the Mission Impossible uh, theme that I give all thanks to some team members, uh, Sabrina and Sarah, around the work of uh, helping me all make some fun slides. On the sustainability, great question. Two things come to mind. First of all, when, if we went back to Mission Impossible phase two and three about, oh, we want a tool and it's an e-health tool. Okay, my question is, we built this tool, where is it going to live? At the end of the day, where is it going to live? And so that was my first question and is always my question with I've done work in the past on e-health tools on the clinician side too. So in terms of sustainability, in terms of the practical of the innovation or the intervention, that's the first question. So over the years, I keep asking that question around where's this going to live? We can prove, you know, we can prove that, oh, it's great. Everybody loves it. It's been used. You know, we can do some research around understanding the effectiveness around it. But once we've done that, like you said, the research stops, the fun stop. What happens? Does it just then sit there and nothing gets updated? You know, because when you're looking at any online app or website how do you keep it um, up to date how do you change to make sure the evidence is updated so that question around sustainability I've asked that question I keep asking it and I know we're fortunate that we um, this work is under the council CKD network and there's other projects similar to this around these interventions or innovations um, with e-health tools for different populations where it's like a bigger question so having that network and partnerships for that piece of it, along with the Kidney Foundation of Canada. Again, these other partnerships and um, relationships that we've built to see where could this tool live. In terms of the sustainability outside of that tool, so we find a place and it lives happily ever after we know that um, dissemination comes into a huge thing around sustainability for like, up the CKD pathway that I mentioned in that there's a cl clinician based tool. Um, we continue to disseminate, but we build it in at, as a package. So we partner with other groups in kidney disease to say, or other like endocrinology, because kidney disease goes hand in hand with um, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. It's because clinicians at the end of the day say, you know what? Well, you're not just one disease. Patients don't see themselves as one disease, right? They come with chronic diseases. They come as a package. They have mental health. They have their chronic kidney or chronic diseases. So, around that sustainable partnership, and then seeing where does it fit, where is that value added to other groups, right? So, it might be something outside in the community, right? That's outside our research kind of domains that we have to think about. Um, another sustainability similar to the work maybe you'll be doing is that because I asked that question way at the beginning is around like pharma companies, right? They, but you know, you have to set some standards around, okay, in terms of intellectual, intellectual properties, but also um, principles. With, this is patient oriented research. Our principles are, our tool will never be at a cost. To, so that's why we have no login for privacy, one, but two, there's no login or no cost to accessing the tool. And you'll see over years, some tools and apps come at a cost because that's the only way they can sustain them because they need to cost recover to maintain like your maintenance costs a year. So things that I could say around sustainability, ask those questions now, who are you partnering with? What are the costs? We keep very detailed um, uh, budgetary costs, like on how much it costs to maintain um, our updates to the website and the builds and the background. And now that we're going through adaptations in our phase two, or our council 2.0, how much is that going to cost and how we bundle them and stuff like that more on the tech side. So I don't know if that answers your question more on the implementation sustainability, but sustainability of these kind of patient facing tools. Yeah, no, that's helpful. And, and we're grappling with the same things also thinking about adaptation and, you know, it being more than just a simple language translation of words yes. and and yeah and how do we sort of cost that out and things like that so that, yeah that's great and then I think the the implementation piece and all you know doing the needs assessment and all those steps um 
is another piece, but, uh, but that was really helpful. Thank you. And maybe we can connect offline because uh, it seems like sure. we're very Email me. For sure. sure. I'm happy Thank to share you. whatever, Sarah. Thanks for the question. Rosman. So yeah, there's something in the chat. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Mo. That was excellent. I just wanted to ask, it was similar to what um, Megan asked around how to select. Uh, just wondering if, you know, you had used the TCAS tool in this uh, project or in any other projects, as I find it's a bit challenging to use. <laughs> I just wanted to get your experience on it. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. <laughs> Throwing in another tool into the mix. <laughs> um, yeah. So the TCAS tool, um, we did not use it and I have not used it based on, again, taking these tools and translating them into terms and language that our partners, be it the research team and other partners can understand you know, when we build the interview guides or even just in, through communications um, in terms of um, figuring out our methodologies and stuff, that this translation is hard. And we see that in practice now or in current state with um, with CIFR, right? CIFR going to 2.0 because, great, it's been developed by scientists, like researchers and implementation. But when we put it in practice, what's really happening? So we get that primary data to understand well, how are people using this tool? Oh, we need to modify the tool itself. So it's like the same cycle in implementation science that we use for um, science of when we do clinical research. Yeah, yeah so no, thank you. I Thanks. agree with you. It's a tough one. TCAST is, yeah, Sarah's tools, yeah, tough. Thank you. Thank you, Rosman. Good to see you. Hi, Selena. Hi Mo, thank you for the presentation. I'm sorry I missed the first half of it. Um, uh, I just wanted to just chime in. So to Sarah's point earlier about the sustainability piece. So um, I'm an implementation support practitioner for CanSolve CKD. So I work very closely with Mo. And the whole this whole notion of sustaining an intervention is 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 something we're all been grappling with, and we're also thinking about a lot of these interventions. We have at least eighteen projects that are that are producing some type of an intervention that's going to be put into practice, and you know we're supporting the 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 implementation of those in different contexts. Um, and a large part of our funding with CanSolve is um, is we get funding from CIHR, and then it's matched with partner funding. So some of the lessons that we've learned around the sustainability piece and that we're having conversations right now with CIHR is what happens at the end of that funding period? What happens to all these fantastic interventions, whether it's a website or an app? But a lot of these interventions are going to have to be sustained and who's going to do it who's going to where's the money going to come from and one of the things that we're we're learning and we're we're sort of thinking about is this relationship with our partner organizations so we're going back to our partner organizations uh, so for example if an organization provided a letter of support to provide in-kind support for one part of the project if we can stay in touch with them and we can show them even early results so for us it's really key to be able to measure the impact and at least to report on it and sometimes you don't have the results right away but things like patient testimonials um, um uh, testimonials and uh, from our providers or their or their service industry that are potentially using some of these interventions to say yeah well things are moving things are like this is you know, resulting in in some outcome, some positive outcome. So it's 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 I don't think it's going to be a one type of an approach. It's going to be multi-pronged. It's got to be connecting back with uh your your funders, thinking about like, is this is this uh, intervention of value as it is? How, if it's going to be adapted, what are those key or essential components of the intervention that you know, that you have to keep and others that can be adapted. So I think it's also documenting the successes, hearing back from the people using them constantly. I don't know if that helps, Mo. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Selena. Um, totally agree about, so, and it made me think about other things. So there's this partnership and relationship building. 
depending on what the intervention is or inter innovation is that you're taking and putting it and, 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 and planning for implementation is also this idea of how you embed it. Like what are the, the, if it's a complex intervention, so I'm talking about a website, but if we're talking about a complex intervention that has clinicians that are seeing people in, the, in a clinical environment that we're using multiple different tools for assessment and it's a, like a program, then it's about when you start looking at how you embed, like not just having the research bodies go in and do this and then test the implementation, but embedding, like making sure that you embed um, people in the clinical environment. And I know I see Caitlin's on, Caitlin, Dr. Caitlin Watson's on the call about the idea of embedding, like we have like pharmacists within the system, right? Like that are embedded already to continue the sustainability. And then you start using all those those um, strategies as peers, like, so, oh, word of mouth through peer support, right? And so using peers and champions and um, on the ground, but they're already embedded, not just taking somebody, putting them in, do the implementation test, do a hybrid kind of like looking at eff um, effectiveness and implementation outcomes, and then removing <laughs> those, those key people. Right. So it's about that embedding. And so that's what we noticed with ours too, embedding like the nurses that were bought into this tool because it made their lives easier because it was a tool because the role is education and building self-management um, or self-efficacy with their patients. So again, that partnerships and em embedding, the, there has to be some of the people are better, like human resources, because you're not going to get mon more money to have people come in unless you prove that you're taking money from somewhere else for human resources and now refiltrating um, and creating a new position. So, yeah. Thanks, Mo. Thanks everyone for the, the great questions. We do have a few minutes left for any any final um, comments or anything. My other question, Mo, was about next steps and sustainability. And I know you've spoken on um, sustainability a bit already but anything any else anything else you want to add about that or anything else yeah. that you didn't get to talk about yeah so those next steps like I, you know it's really made us realize like this adaptations to the tool and adaptations potentially um around implementation strategies like looking at um scaling up nationally even though the website's there for patients and caregivers but clinicians across the board national we all have different clinicals um funding structures like for say primary care and and how they access uh, specialty care so i think for us we thought when we were talking about i said indigenous needs and sexual health and reproductive health around kidney disease thought it'd be like oh this is going to be easy peasy we got four years of funding to do that again we go back and talk about engagement with and um, building relationships with our um, Indigenous communities that takes time. Like, so um, I feel that the idea around our funding structures and the disconnect between how long it, like we, to do any implementation, as everybody knows, number one is engagement and relationship building, trust building, um, and value added to each of these partners that um, I feel that, okay, we have two more years to go and we're still, kind of working at it and plugging along, but learning along the way. And it's great, uh, like Sarah mentioned, the project they're working on, it's great to talk with people that are doing this because I think that's the knowledge uh, consolidation of sharing like, these experiences to build from. And as uh, Selena mentioned, our, the network trying to build on that too. So yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> there might be a Mission Impossible like 10 by the time <laughs> we've done this, but um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question, Megan.